This is a production of Cornell University. If you think of other plants around the world that do things in this spectacular fashion, so Hawaiian silver swords, for example, uh, the giant puya from, from Bolivia and Peru, uh, other examples, uh, the, the century plant, the giant agaves from our own deserts, these plants are like salmon. Right? They live a long time, they reproduce once, and it exhausts and kills them, the act of reproduction. What's remarkable to me about this is that it's, it's marshalling that kind of energy and that kind of floral display, but it gets a chance to reproduce over and over again. And that's what we were discussing before you all arrived as to like, how does it balance its energy? Does it, does it engage in just really extraordinary photosynthetic rates and, photo, and photosynthetic um, you know, productivity? in ways that those other plants can't. All of the plants I mentioned uh, either grow at high elevation in the tropics or on desert islands. And so the problem there is not photosynthesis because they have lots of sun. It's that it's drought. It's, you know, and these plants don't have that problem. They're, they're, they grow in rainforests and, and, and they're not limited by moisture. So it also, as another lesson, it reminds us that plant reproductive strategies are also limited by where they live, what kind of soil they're on, what kind of environment they're in. Etc. So, so there's another another thing that we're looking to to to, to study this time around. Um, we tracked, as you can see in this in this sheet, uh, we tracked the odors that we've studied in other plants and that we expected to see. There have been other people studying this plant and publishing their results, and so we weren't shocked by anything. Um, some of our faculty, Carl Nicholas, for example, smelled the fishy odor um, uh, on the morning after and asked, you know, is, it, is there an amine in there? And, and sure enough, there are the very low levels of um, compounds that we're very sensitive to. Trimethylamine is kind of rotting fish odor. Uh, and what we've wondered this time around is, is that actually um, a volatile coming off the pollen grains? Because it started showing up in our study when the pollen was available in the, inside the flower. So this time around, we, we might like to collect some pollen and do a separate scent collection from the pollen itself. And the reason why that's of more than trivial interest is for the animals that are getting co covered and coated with pollen, um, it's very important that they don't groom, okay? One of the reasons, so a question that com commonly arises when we look at this plant is, why is it so large? Why so big? Why is it so overstated? Anything in nature that's, that's exaggerated or overstated is interesting to us. Um, and one of the things that people suggest is that the population density of these plants is so small. They don't grow in groves, right? There's one here, one there, um, that they have to advertise from a distance to get their pollinators to find them the second time, the third time, because it doesn't work unless they get duped two or three times in the process of a, of, of a week. Um, and so one of the things we wanted to know is um, how does that transition work? From, from, male, from female stage to, to male stage, the, the flies have to fly with the pollen on their bodies. They might have to fly 500 meters or a kilometer or two or three kilometers to find the next one of these before they can enact, you know, they can complete the, the, the loop and, and, and close the loop on pollination. Uh, it's important that they don't groom the pollen off their bodies while they're doing that, okay? And if you watch insects as much as we do, a lot of insects are fastidious. They'll hit four or five flowers, fly to a perch, sit on the perch, and then brush themselves. Flies are very good at this, where you've all seen them kind of do this with their hind legs and their forelegs and clean themselves off. They have brushes on their legs to clean their antennae so they can smell again, right? Um, our moths that we study, we study these very large hawk moths that visit night blooming flowers like the Darwin's orchid from Madagascar that Paul has shared with us in, in years past. They're, they're slobs, they don't groom, and they're gypsies, they, they fly tens of miles a night. So they're a dream for plants because they don't waste the, the plant's pollen investment in them and they're able to move pollen long distances without wiping it off their bodies. So um, here we're, we're kind of interested in, in that, that the male part of the, of the plant too. Um, are, the, are the insects leaving at dawn the following day and, if, and are they doing so with pollen on their bodies? And is there something about the odor of that pollen that might you know, make them more likely to leave it where it is. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web, 
at cornell.edu.